Got it. Thank you. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen okay. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, as we said, this is a, a presentation about Quick Red Fox, optimizing classroom interviews with self-regulated learning and affect detection. And we start off with Ryan, I think. Hi, I'm Ryan. Uh, so qualitative research is an important approach for getting deep and phenomenological um, understanding, understanding how students think about their own thinking. Um, of student thinking. And interviews in particular are a great method for understanding student thinking because you can go in depth far more than you could with like a survey instrument and you can follow up on student responses, which is something you can't do with open-ended like, you know, surveys. So for this reason, interviews have had a really important place in design research and in educational research in general for quite some time. <laughs> However, there's a reason why we don't all use interviews for our primary method all the time, and that's because interview-based qualitative research is highly time-intensive. Um, if you take, for example, an, uh, an interview researcher studying students using a learning system in classrooms, like Janet Schofield in her classic book, Computers and Classroom Culture, oh my gosh, what student should she interview at any given time? And if the interview is interested in a specific phenomenon, like changes in self-regulated learning or affect, How's the interview you're gonna know how to find it? Uh, one person can't watch 24 students at the same time. Interviewing well after the fact might not be a good thing. Um, people will forget what they were thinking. And so you have this kind of one shot or needle in a haystack problem. There's like maybe one student at a given moment that's, that you wanna interview, but how do you know which student to interview at that moment? So we call this, like I said a minute ago, I got ahead of myself, the needle in a haystack problem. If you're interested in a phenomenon that occurs intermittently or occasionally, like say gaming a system. Gaming a system is associated with much worse learning outcomes, but it occurs only around 3% of the time in most classrooms. With prior methods, either you need to do a lot of interviews to catch the right moment, or you need to continually observe students and interview occasionally, but still a lot of behaviors are kind of hard to see, or you need to do retrospective interviews and students may be less accurate about their cognition. There has to be a better way. And about five or six years ago, our group came together and said, we're gonna to try to find that better way. We call this better way, Quick Red Fox. Quick Red Fox is an infrastructure and an app that first of all, identifies student behaviors, strategies, affect or transitions among those things that are of, of scientific interest to a qualitative researcher. For example, a student going from frustrated to bored. We then notify that qualitative researcher in real time. It happens a couple seconds later, they know about it. <clears throat> we facilitate interview data collection and the collection of other relevant field notes. And we synchronize that back into the student interaction log data so we can see exactly what was going on in the software and how that corresponded to the interview um, data. Quick Red Fox links into the learning system and transmit recommendations to the interviewer in real time, helping the interviewer target her or his time and collect qualitative data on the phenomena that she or he wants to study. Here is the uh, Quick Red Fox uh, interface you can see. It's very simple. Um, it tells you at the top who the student is, um, what the trigger was. In this case, a student going through DeMello's cycle of engaged to confused, to frustrated, to bored. It allows uh, the researcher to collect notes in the white box in the middle, and they can start recording an interview when they're ready. Um, when they're done with it, they can click next. They can also click skip if they wanna not interview this student, maybe because there's something that's going on uh, with the student that makes them no longer interviewable. Maybe they've interviewed the student too much, although the app tries to control for that. Maybe there's something else they wanna go, that they wanna cut to. Hi, this is Jacqueline. So our research goals for the project where we piloted this app and, and the associated infrastructure, we were hoping to understand how emotion and self-regulated learning were connected. Uh, and so the kinds of events that we were used or typically looking for were either these kinds of affective dynamics, um, like we just saw in the previous slide, um, or other kinds of strategic behaviors that might be related to affective shifts or just to, to trying to control and regulate the student's learning. Um, 
specifically, we were hoping to interview students at key times that were related to these learning instances and, and looking for these shifts and strategies. These were things that might be difficult to identify through other kinds of uh, methodologies. Hi, I'm Anubu. So let me start with an overview of how we set up the QRF app. So we use the app to interview middle school students uh, about their SRL processes during a classroom study. And they were working on the Berry Spain environment during this process. So each student worked out their own individual laptops. And these laptops were connected via a router to a Berry Spain data server, which is the figure you see in the middle. And then the server is what performed the communication with the QRF app that were in the hand of the interviewers. So at the Betty Spring student or client end, we had these algorithms for pattern detection. So they would take the student's mouse clicks and derive sequences of actions from them and then try to detect uh, patterns of uh, their self-regulated learning process or their emotion transitions. And these would get communicated to the Betty Spring server when they were detected. And the server would perform some pattern distillation process such as prioritization and so on. And the pattern with the highest priority would be communicated with the QRF app using a RabbitMQ broker. So once uh, an app is ready to receive a pattern and they get a pattern message from the server, the interviewer can click the record button and start uh, recording, like doing an interview with the student. And then at the end of the interview process, the entire interview along with the student information and the pattern which triggered the interview would be recorded and would be, would be logged in the app. Next. So now I'll go into a bit more detail on each of these steps. So first the pattern detection. So we had these algorithms built within the Betty Spring environment, which would do the pattern detection process. And these detectors would use a sliding window of students' actions in Betty Spring. So for example, in Betty Spring, the students are trying to build these causal models of uh, science processes. So for example, if a student is uh, reading a page and then they're adding an incorrect link in the model and then they decide to take a quiz. So this would be the sequence of actions. And from there, we would try to, our algorithm would try to detect a pattern. Uh, and they would try to detect patterns which are of interest to us and which signify that the student is trying an, a self-regulation strategy. And then there was another algorithm within the Betty Sprint system, which would look for affect transitions. So this one would take the help of machine learning models to detect students' uh, affect likelihoods at a 20 second interval and then try to find transitions between those affect states. For example, if a student went from being confused to frustrated or confused to bored. And then once a, an, a behavior pattern or an affect pattern is detected at the server, this would be, uh, sorry, at the client, this would be attached to a, uh, the student ID from where this was detected. And also this would be assigned a priority value based on research questions or past theory. And then this entire thing, the pattern message along with the student ID and the priority value would be sent to the Betty Spring data server for processing. Now at the server, each pattern message that we get from the student machines or the client machines is assigned a timestamp uh, and they would be inserted into a priority queue. And this priority queue is the one which uh, determines which pattern will be sent to the QRF app for interviewing. So this sorts each message by the pattern priority that is assigned at the client. And it also ensures that the same student is not interviewed too often. Uh, and it, uh, a message stays in the priority queue until a request is made by the interviewer who has the QRF and the app in their hand, or in the case that the message expires after a certain time interval, in which case it's expelled from the queue. And we have this one uh, just in case, because we don't want to interview a student on something which a prompt which happened long time back, which is not relevant to what they're doing right now. And so once a pattern is requested for by the QRF app, it's sent from the server to the app using a RabbitMQ message broker. So in this slide, you see some screenshots of the app interface. So first, uh, uh, the, this is what the, the interviewer holding the app would see. So first, the, they would have to uh, register with the Berry Spain data server. So this establishes the communication between the server and the app. And then they would enter the details of the class that they're interviewing, the class name and other details. And once they, are, they have done that, they are now ready to receive a pattern from the app. Now, the, the pattern, once the pattern comes in, they would see something like the third screen which is that they would see the student information at the top and they would be able to start recording by clicking the start recording button. They also have the option to skip a pattern if uh, just in case. 
and they can end the interview whenever they want. And once they end an interview, they would be able to upload the interview from that session and finish the, the current session or they, they, would, they can also move on to another class. So as Annabelle explained, we're going to get a timestamp and a sequence um, of either affective states or behaviors that are sent out to an interviewer. And then the interviewer has the choice of whether or not they're ready to interview the child. If the child has gotten up from their seat, or in one particular case, there was a kid who was having a particularly bad day and crying, and this seemed like not a good reason, you know, not a good, not a good time to interrupt the child. Um, then that of course we'd want to move on to the next available code. Um, the process that we went through with the interviews generated tons and tons of data that we were able to analyze by transcribing the interviews, uh, but we also were able to add things sort of on the fly. And so we noticed, for example, um, as we were working on this project, that there were some students that seemed to be particularly high in anxiety and we were able to add scales for science anxiety and for feelings of difficulty to the end of our project so that we were able to supplement the data that we were already collecting with things that we're, we were able to uh, normalize across different students. Our typical interview protocol, and in this particular case with the pilot interview that we have, we had two interviewers. We really strove to take a helpful but non-authoritative role when we were interacting with the kids. So the way I describe this is, is like a friendly older sister. Uh, I'm not going to bust them on minor infractions, but I'm not going to let them, you know, hurt themselves or anybody near them. Um, so, you know, so a serious person, but somebody that they could trust and, and could almost treat as a peer as much as as much as somebody my age can pull that off. Um, we went with open and ended interviews to start. Uh, and we usually started most of the interviews kind of throughout the process by asking what strategies, you know, how the child was doing and, and what strategies they were using. We asked about their feelings and their, pro uh, their progress as they went on. And as we started to learn and notice things, we started asking more specific kinds of questions that weren't necessarily related um, technically to the the software that they were working on. So for example, we were interested in their intrinsic interest in science. So we would throw in a question like, what's your favorite subject? What kind of books do you like to read? We'd ask who their favorite teacher was and why and see if we could tease the information out that way. And we were able to get a fair amount of information kind of as, as we went by just sort of being clever about the, the kinds of things that we asked uh, as we went along. Uh, one thing that we noticed was that there is a mentor agent within the system of Betty's Brain, which is the, the learning software that we were using. And Mr. Davis had a couple of uh, communication styles that were really upsetting to a few students when we first started this. Um, and we made some changes to that between the first and second study. Um, when we did, we of course wanted to make sure that these were effective changes. And so we went back and asked the students in the interviews and then again, in surveys afterwards about whether or not Mr. Davis had become more helpful. Cool. So as Jacqueline alluded to there, um, this uh, method yielded uh, a good chunk of data that um, I'm just going to walk through right now. So the data can be broadly kind of split into, into three groups. We have the log data from Betty's brain, uh, and that included the affective labels um, that were being triggered every 20, the predictions that were being predicted every 20 seconds. We have the QRF files, and we have the survey data. Um, and to talk through kind of how we went about analyzing these, uh, we need to go a little bit into more detail on these QRF files. Um, and they can be split into two components. We have the raw audio file, and then we also have an accompanying metadata file for every interview that was conducted. So starting out with the metadata file, it's gonna contain a lot of the information that, that Arvo was mentioning from, from the server side processes. Um, so each ID is going to have a recording ID to make sure we compare the metadata uh, with the audio. We're gonna record the student ID of the student that is being interviewed. We have the, the trigger, be that the behavioral trigger or the affective trigger. That's logged there as well. 
the time of the trigger um, along with the time that the recording started so we can make sure that gap uh, is not too large um, and validate uh, gut check that um, expulsion that, that was mentioned before. Um, and also the recording end time so that we can also just validate that uh, the, the audio file that we have matches the metadata that was collected as, a, as an extra validation step. Um, we also record the interviewer um, in our initial case study. We had two interviewers using the QRF app um, simultaneously. So we wanted to make sure that we could um, just, in, if anything, additional collection was necessary, that we could pair back to the right interviewer. Um, I've not mentioned it here, but also in this metadata file would be any notes that were taken by the interviewer in that uh, notes section that you already saw. When it comes to the audio file for our study, we uh, manually transcribed the audio files. The reason for doing that was we considered the, uh, the automatic transcription, but given that these were younger voices and the known inaccuracies, we wanted to make sure that the transcription uh, was as accurate as possible. So we use human transcription here. Um, and from that transcription, we then generate a series of interview codes and coded the data um, here specifically for self-regulated learning. Um, and so all of our codes and constructs were relative to self-regulation, uh, but it is easy to see how you could uh, adapt your coding mechanism for the constructs that you're interested in studying. So what we end up with is a coded audio file uh, and the metadata that we can then pair with our survey data um, and also with our log data using those user IDs and the timestamps. And so we end up with two uh, data sets. One is coded interviews and surveys. So this would be at the student level. The surveys occurred pre and post and include some of those measures that Jacqueline already spoke about the anxiety measure, uh, self-efficacy measure, as well as a pre and post test um, to assess concept knowledge. And so that allows for a student level analysis. But then we also have the time sync interviews, which we can merge with the student log data. And so if our gray arrow here is a student session, we can place each coded interview in a student session and then specifically analyze what was happening before the interview that might have affected the codes and also what happens after the interview and how maybe the interview changed the process or things that were vocalized during the interview are then manifested uh, after, after the interview. And so we can use this for a, a more interview level analysis, uh, breaking down individual parts of the Betty's Brain session as opposed to the student level analysis that's facilitated by merging the coded interviews with the survey data. Uh, and this approach has been, um, has yielded, yielded a really rich data set. Uh, I'm gonna very quickly run you through some of the findings that we have from our initial study. Um, and so we were able to improve uh, self-regulated learning predictions um, by merging our interview codes with the survey data and the log data. And what we found here was we could best predict how students were going to regulate their time in a future scenario in a future learning experience by combining those three streams. And the combination of the three data streams performed better than any uh, other combination of, of two or just a singular data set. We also saw that those same combinations could improve predictions of learning. Again, in, the, in future uh, scenarios, how a student was interviewing in our first session, uh, which occurred in December, was predictive of how their learning would be in their second session um, it, which, was, which happened six to eight weeks later in February. We've also seen uh, insight into student frustration, looking at what causes student frustration uh, and how students respond to frustration. I'm really getting into the, the details of the transcripts here and seeing, picking out individual students to, to better understand uh, how that frustration impacts their behaviors, impacts their learning and impacts how they respond to our interviews, the actual content of their interview as well. Um, as Jacqueline mentioned, we were also able to isolate some, some pain points in the system, um, which we could then use for iterative redesign, as well as you know, that we were able to adjust our study in the middle to add those extra measures, but also we were able to um, change the system very rapidly as well. And finally, 
um, improved understanding of, of metacognition and validating a previous measure that would extract uh, predict metacognition from the text of the transcripts um, rather than the codes, and then comparing that with the affect uh, and examining the relationship there. Um, and a quick sneak peek currently under review is some work looking at um, student anxiety and, and how the way that students regulate their anxiety impacts the way that they then regulate their learning. And I'm going to pass over to Luke now. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to wrap up a little bit um, our kind of presentation here. Uh, but to kind of wrap up, what I'd like to do is kind of take a step back and go back to our initial driving motivation for this work, uh, which was this idea that, you know, we've been doing a lot of work using data driven models and this kind of model that we would develop using learning analytics, educational data mining, or other related methods. And they've been really good, really helpful, allow us to examining a large amount of data at scale. And they can be very helpful in terms of finding meaningful patterns in the data, whether they're related to self-regulated learning, affect, or anything else that we might be interested in, and allowing us to investigate how those patterns might relate to the student's learning experience. However, one of the things they're not as good at is providing kind of deeper insights into the underlying cause of the observed patterns. And those are really important in terms of contextualizing the patterns, understanding how the students are experienced the learning activity, uh, and understanding how we can support the students better. Um, on the other end, interview data can provide us with this kind of rich and detailed information that can provide the new and sometimes unexpected insights into those underlying uh, causes that can then help us in better interpreting the, the data-driven analysis. However, those are pretty time consuming to collect and they can be pretty difficult to kind of target at scale to know when and who we should interview. And so our goal here was to combine those two approaches by developing a tool that would allow us to more easily conduct those kind of data-driven qualitative interviews. And so the way we approach that is through the development of the Quick Red Fox infrastructure and application with the goal of helping researchers conduct those data-driven qualitative interviews by allowing the researchers to say like, okay, for this study, here is the kind of pattern in the data that we're really interested in understanding what's going on. We know that this is important, but we want to understand really specifically what's going on at, in the student's learning experience at those moments. And so Quick Red Fox allows us to kind of target the time and effort of the researcher so they can, uh, they can focus it on exactly what they want to study. And so Stephen showed you kind of different ways that we've used this approach in terms of studying uh, phenomena around self-regulated learning and affect. But we're also very excited about what are the other things that we could do with this approach. And we are definitely planning on continuing this to use this approach in the future to in other contexts. Uh, but we're also very happy to share what we've done with other people if you're interested in this kind of approach. So if, you, if you're be interested in the app or the infrastructure, you want to collaborate, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, and of course, we're also more than happy to answer any question you might have uh, today since we have plenty of time for questions. So thank you everyone for attending. I haven't been keeping track of the chat since I was doing the conclusion, but anyone in the team has kept track and has any question that you would like to answer. I already got an answer, but I just would be really curious if you did like replay the audio recordings with students and got reactions or tried to dig deeper during a follow-up interview where they could also hear what they said during those sort of on the spot interviews. I'd be super curious to know like what kind of an effect that might have on their ability to recall the experience. That's a really interesting question. I'm probably gonna pass it on to Jacqueline if she was the one doing the interview. One thing I will say is that we didn't really think about that while we were developing the application. So right now the application, there's not really a way to, to just pull a previous interview 
uh, while you're doing the data collection, but maybe Jacqueline has some insights about whether she feels like this could be a, a good, like what kind of insight we could get from the classroom if we did something like that. Right, I, and I think that's, you know, one question is the infrastructure. The other question is how feasible is that to do in a classroom? Um, you know, because they were often sitting in, in pods. And so there was often a little bit of overlap with the students that were talking to. I did often follow up, you know, particularly if a student seemed to be really struggling or upset. Um, you know, when I, when I came back around the second time, I usually asked if they were doing a little better um, and what had caused that shift to try to get that metacognitive, but we didn't actually listen to their own words. So that, that would definitely be an interesting next step. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jacqueline. I think there was also, during the second data collection, some students finished early and there was some kind of exit interview. Was that right? Right, and actually, um, yeah, Annabelle ran some of those. So Annabelle, did you wanna? Yeah, but we, we didn't specifically ask them about like their, their what, what they thought of the interviews. So yeah. You know, so, uh, I see one question about if students had any idea why they were being picked out for interviews. Uh, and the short answer is sort of, um, you know, we told them that we were trying to help students understand um, or trying to make improvements to the system. And so we needed information from them about what they were doing and what their experiences were like. Um, and that you know, we would come talk to them as it looked like, you know, they might have interesting things to say, but we weren't very specific. Um, and, and in part that was on purpose because, you know, should we be wrong, particularly with the affective judgments, we don't want to induce a new affective state because they are trying to figure out how we came to that conclusion. I'll also just can... add there that, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Sue. I was just gonna say that, uh... With, with regard to selection as well, I will say that um, almost all the students had interviews at, at some point during the process. So it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't as though a individual student felt like, wow, I'm being interviewed all the time and the person sitting next to me has never never had to be interviewed. So um, it was actually the case that all of the students um, were, were being interviewed with the exception perhaps a, you know one that was was having a particularly difficult day. The rest the, the triggers were happening enough and were frequent enough that actually it didn't feel like any individual student was, was being singled out. So I wanted to <clears throat> make a comment on Muffy's question, which is that um, the question is, you know, it seems like over time these interactions between the student and the interviewer would, would influence students' SRL behaviors because you'd be talking about SRL. And I do think that there's an extent to which it did. Um, you know, that's what Nigel observed more or less. Um, our papers aside from that, I haven't looked into the issue, but I actually think that this is true of any embedded in the moment interview technique. And the big difference we have here is that because we have an ability to target who we interview and because we can link back the interview data to exactly what was going on before and after it, I think that uh, Quick Red Fox would be more amenable to studying this issue than any other protocol I can think of for interviews. So I think that you've got a great question. It's one I haven't really seen research, and I think that our app could be part of that if you or anybody else wanted to use it to study that. I was also curious for the people that were conducting the interviews. Um, did did you can you give me a little bit more of a description of the experience of being triggered by the app to go and do an interview? Um, so was it an experience where you're sitting in a room in a classroom and you don't see a lot of discernible difference amongst the students and the app is telling you who to go and speak to or are you seeing a lot of variation the apps may be sending you in a direction and then was there any possible contention that you had where like app wants me to talk to the student so and so but i'm seeing some other interesting stuff going on over here so was there any draw from just random student behaviors that were not modeled uh, that were in competition for who you were interested in talking to at this. Right. So one thing that we did do uh, in the notes section of the app really facilitated this was if a student grabbed us and said, hey, I want to talk to you, then we would put down that student's username and just do the interview with that particular student and then move on. Um, the, you know, 
in terms of like the physical experience, you are crouched down next to a small child <laughs> in a classroom. And uh, at one point, I think I tried even a, a golf chair and that ended badly um, be, because you're just focused on that particular kid. And so you're not actually scanning the room for very long before the app finds another pattern. And we had enough of a, enough length to our prioritization patterns um, that it almost always it was able to detect something new within a good, you know, 20 or 30 seconds of, of an interview. So there wasn't a whole lot of downtime between interviews. If there was, and yes, I tried to get up and, and kind of see what was going on, but it's a, it's a different system than a regular observation protocol where you would, would have a pretty good idea, even if you were doing students one at a time on their observations, you'd have a pretty good idea of what was going on in the classroom overall. And I see Lou's asking about effects on who asked the questions. Um, you know, we had basically two of us who are, were running um, the observations. And I think there probably were some interview effects, you know, at least in terms of who was, um, you know, because we took a slightly, slightly different role. Um, so we had one, uh, the other interviewer who did do a lot more explaining of the system and the students did give her different kinds of answers and different kinds of responses uh, because I had not worked with the system and because I, I felt like our, our primary goal was to extract this sort of self-regulated learning out of the, um, I guess the descriptions of the self-regulated learning out of the students. Um, that's that was not the kind of interactions that I had with students. So I, I do think that it is important to kind of stick to one role um, when when we're doing this kind of work and really um, make sure that that you're there in a way that communicates that you're you're there to understand how they're doing and you're not there with the goal of them doing specific things within the system. I can say that we did we did control for interviewer in some of our analysis, um, but um, nothing to the extent of, of perhaps what you're mentioning in terms of, of the power level and the relationship. And that would be something that, that would be really interesting to, to examine. Right. And we we were both women in the same age bracket. And, you know, for that matter, when you're 12, anybody over 16 is old. So <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> that power dynamic is what it is, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and maybe to add a little bit of kind of meta reflection on the process, right? This is, was our first experience with not only developing the application, but running it in the classroom. And so I think we learned a lot about what to do, uh, how to do it. And we still have a lot of ongoing question about like, did we do it the right way? Uh, because again, this was our first time. I think if you talk to like Steven and other people in our team about, you know, um, mapping all the different data source together, uh, we spent a lot of time doing this because it was our first time doing it. Um, but the next time we'll do it, we're going to go much faster because we know what are kind of the things that to look for. And I think that also is true for the interview themselves, right? There's we were kind of experimenting not only with you know self-regulated learning and affect but also we were more or less experimenting with this as a is this a viable way of collecting data for our research i think that kind of answers my next question that i had that i'm just going to talk out loud instead of keep typing um is like i was curious how many times you've done this and like if you've used it in any context outside of like betty's brain or like automated or Kind of interactions there of like what does this look like in different kinds of classrooms like collaborative classrooms of like interjecting and having that moment with a group or like sparking conversations through those interview questions like I was kind of curious of that but it seems like you haven't used it a ton correct <laughs> is there space to continue that work in different types of classrooms that's why we're here um we're looking for folks to use it we have a couple irons in the fire in terms of grant proposals to kind of expand it but but if you or anybody here wants to use the app, we're happy to support it because 
we want it to be used in more contexts. We're very interested in everything you just said. The the triggering system is is super versatile, I think, too. Like if you've got the the events that then the app will work, providing you can define the events of interest cleanly. Um, then I think you're good to go. Um, log logistically, like how how does it know where the kids are physically sitting, seating, like when you're triggered or asked to go and do an interview? It doesn't. I have to figure it out. We had a map of the students' locations on our. <laughs> okay. So it's just giving you a student name, and then you have like your own map. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did you try just having people like audio record or like a think aloud response triggered off of these events or something like that and take a little interviewer out? Did, I we, mean, did, yeah. We didn't sorry. use that methodology. I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting one. And I think we've got some, some very comparable, there, there's ways in which that approach is very comparable, but there's some ways that, you know, we can actually steer the student, we sort of offload that information as well, um, so that we're not asking them to do an additional thing <laughs> and remember what they're we're supposed to be processing in these things aloud. Uh, and it gives us the ability to pivot as we learn things in the classroom. So, you know, for example, adding in the, the kinds of questions about their intrinsic interest uh, is not something that would have been really easy to do with an automated think aloud that was using the same kinds of prioritization patterns. It, it might also be interesting to set up a study where you let students select if they want to audio record themselves or have an interviewer contact them. Um, because I know that like me personally, I'll tell you anything, right? Oh yeah, oh, yeah that's the prompt, I'll give you an honest response, you know? So I think there's probably people out there that might be very receptive to that um, and might even prefer it. Uh, to sort of talk to the computer as opposed to talk to a person. But right. that's another thing that would be interesting to consider. Right. I think, you know, 12 year olds can be remarkably honest. Uh, and so many of them were not shy at all about telling us exactly what they thought about any given situation or context or feature. Um, some of them, as they went, through the system because most of them, you know, the process of making a causal map is not something that any of them were familiar with. About half the class was still causing, calling it a casual map at the end of the second study. Um, so this was this was a very, very uh, new kind of intellectual task for them to be doing. And they were pretty brutally honest throughout the process. Um, I, I think the other thing that we did was the other interviewer was affiliated with Vanderbilt, but it was pretty clear and we made it very clear that I was not. Um, and that, and, you know, anytime they asked me about the system, I was like, oh, tell me about it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so that opened up some space for them to give me that kind of, of feedback um, in a way that they might not have if, you know, if they were an adult with those strong politeness filter. <laughs> yeah, maybe expanding a little bit on that. One of the things that came out of one of the study, one of the first study that we were completely not expecting, and Jacqueline mentioned it in her presentation, was kind of the student's reaction to the mentor agent. And so that allowed us to kind of quickly say like, oh, there's something, it's not a difficult fix to change what the mentor agent says or how he says it. So we were able to quickly make change. And then in the interview in the next session, because it was the same students, we were able to see that they had a little bit of a better reaction to the agent. But also one of the things that opened up as kind of an idea in our mind is, can we use this kind of approach to facilitate designing learning environment, not just to do research on specific like affect or something like that, but can we use this as a tool that we go when we're testing an application that we're developing in terms of 
Can we use this as a tool to understand how students are experiencing it? And then can we do rapid prototyping um, that would be kind of driven by those real time interview? You do the prototyping, you change something, and then the next day or the next week, you deploy it with the students again, and then you see how they react to it differently. And so that's not something we've done, but an idea that we've had in terms of maybe a future um, kind of way we could use this approach. I'm also curious about the choice to show the predictive model event that triggered the interaction. And it seems like one way that might be an interesting application of this tool would be to not let the interviewer know what the trigger event was to sort of help contain or, or avoid any sort of like shaping that the interviewer, micro interview or whatever you call it, might, might have. Um, and then go back and see if um the data models that you're creating still build predictive power when it's sort of a blinded interview as opposed to one the event that they're trying to gather details about obviously there'd be a couple of reasons why that might not work out the same like you might not know what to ask because you don't know what the triggering event was um but also like i'm curious how much the interviews got shaped by knowing or having transparency of the prediction yeah, I actually don't think we used that information as much as we could have in those interviews, um, in part because just navigating the classroom to find the student was a little bit challenging, and in part because we really started with, how are you doing? Is it okay if I talk to you? What have you been doing? What's your strategy? Is it effective? And, and then let the student sort of guide it from there. Um, so if the student really didn't know what to say, or if the student seemed really frustrated during the interview, then you know, we tried to be as conciliatory as we could about that and just really acknowledge those feelings, but get them to just talk it through. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jacqueline. I think the kind of the the trigger was used more as a background to kind of inform a little bit the discussion. But one of the issues that we ran into was that uh, it's really difficult to ask specific question about emotion. And it's it's kind of a little bit awkward to go to the student and say like, you were bored, why were you bored? And so you can't really, so that's the part that's tricky. So I think you're right. In some cases, you know, having the information might really kind of narrow down what kind of question you might ask. But I think in, in other cases, and that was the case for us as well, the, it was interesting to have the information, but at the same time, the questions were not necessarily focused directly on what was the trigger. And so maybe the, it would be interesting to know what would have happened if Jacqueline didn't know what the trigger were. Did did you did you so did you code the way in which the students describe their own emotional state and try to categorize that in, in any sort of way and then compare that to the predictive models? Or maybe I'm asking it. We did not ask specifically, usually, about their emotional state unless it was really apparent that the child was really upset, um, you know, or if they, you know, looked like they just had a victory. Um, if there had been some sort of marked change between the two interviews, definitely I tried to acknowledge that. But we didn't start an interview by saying, "Hey, you know," if you say, "Hey, how are you feeling?" Most people say, "Fine," <laughs> and we didn't push that. Right. All of the states map to find. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. This is this is where self-report can be challenging, right? So that's gonna make our, our affect models much easier to do in the future. The prediction is always gonna be fine. Hundred percent accuracy. In general, <clears throat> affect all jokes aside, self-reported affect and external observer reported affect tends not to agree very well, even when external observers agree with each other extremely well. Um, and there's like several findings of that from groups other than our own as well. Um, since we had a reasonably good detection of affect, not perfect, but kind of good enough for our purposes, we decided not to focus there because we wanted to ask questions about other stuff. But certainly you could imagine that this kind of protocol could easily be used. For example, if you had an affect detector where, where you didn't trust your detector, or maybe where you actually really wanted to research the degree to which observations of affect disagree. You certainly could use an app like this one. This wasn't our, our focus. And 
I think one of the exciting things about this, this app and this protocol is just what an amazingly large number of uses one could put the, an app like this to. That's why we wanted to share it with y'all and see who might be interested in playing in our sandbox. Yeah, I actually think one research question I have, you know, particularly with the, an affective state like frustration, uh, but I think to some extent, especially also with boredom, um, these are affective states that might have more than one cause. And if we're guessing right, that's one research question. But, you know, assuming that we are, can the students tell me why they're frustrated or can they tell me why they're bored? And can it help us to identify the kids who aren't being challenged enough versus the kids who are being over challenged? Uh, I, I think is a very important kind of research question that this would be good for. Yeah, and maybe to add on to that, I, I know in some of the past projects that we've had, um, one of the affect detectors that we built, the frustration defect detector, I had to implement it to run it in real time. And I had to test it. And it turns out that the most predictive feature in that model was that a specific type of actions that the student could do in the learning environment. And then when I was testing it, I, I understood why the students were frustrated because the way that that action was implemented in the, in the environment was really frustrating. It took a long time. It took the control away from the user. It was not a fun interaction to do. And so that frustrated the student. And, but that has nothing to do with their learning like with the learning content itself, it's the design of the learning environment. So being able to identify, you know, what are the different reasons why someone is frustrated that can help us in different ways in terms of, you know, understanding that, oh, maybe in this case, it's a design decision that we've made. Maybe in this case, the student is not being challenged enough. Maybe in this case, the student is being challenged too much. And then if we could understand that, I think we could kind of react to frustration or, or make decisions around frustration in a way that's more meaningful than just saying, we know that the student is frustrated. Any other questions? Yes, not. <laughs> that was a great session. Lots of yeah. Lots of do you guys want to? Do you guys want to uh, sign off with anything in particular? Conclude with anything, or we good, Ben? I not anything major, but maybe echoing what Ryan was saying. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to work with anyone who's interested in this. Uh, we'd be happy to share the method or the tools that we've developed uh, to the extent that it's possible. Awesome. Thank you, Luke. And, and thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, definitely don't hesitate to reach out, as they said, and for some good opportunities, opportunities for collaboration. And um, if you are interested in any further learning analytics learning network events, um, if you missed the beginning, um, I'll uh, post the uh, links here in the chat, but uh, we definitely invite you to join us in the future. And we hope to have more uh, uh, more sessions coming up um, with this group as well. Some great work. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Always love uh, visiting Learning Analytics Learning Network. Thank you for it. Thanks for all the great questions and comments. Yes. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Really, really great discussion. Love it. Good to see all of you again. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.